Am I all right to share my screen? Yes. Cool. Um, Oops, I'm sorry. Did I just accidentally stop you sharing? I'm not sure. Um, yes. Okay. Is that is that visible to to everybody, or at least to? Yes. Yeah. Okay. In principle, it is. If there are any difficulties in hearing me or seeing the slides, then then please please let us know. As as Eva said. Um. So hi. Um. So this this session is instructor onboarding for uh, data carpentry, the uh, image processing with Python beta. Um, what the session will include is some sort of background. Uh, this this lesson come to be, and I'm, I'm going to hand over to Toby Hodges for that in a minute or two, um, and then uh, I'm going to go through. Uh, a lot of the, the the content of the lesson and some sort of, uh, sort of motivation as to to why we would want to to teach it and and what's in it, um, and create some space if we can for discussion to to find out a bit more about people who might want to teach the lesson and uh, and learn uh, what their questions are uh, about about the content and, and how to teach it. But first, uh, thank you very much to Carpentries and to CarpentryCon for, for having this session um, and for everyone who's who's come along and the people who are helping facilitate the session. Thank you very much. We'll do some introductions at this point. So I'll introduce myself and then um, I'll, I'll hand uh, I'll ask uh, David and then Toby to, to introduce themselves and then we'll hand over to, to Toby to do the next few slides, which are kind of the background of where the lessons come from. So uh, I'm, I'm Bob. Uh, I am currently in the middle of uh, <laughs> middle of England near Sheffield. The University of Sheffield is where I'm based. Uh, I'm a senior research software engineer. My, uh, yeah, my background's a mix of um, software engineering in the private sector, quite a lot of research and a lot of my research involves uh, uh, image analysis. Uh, in, in various programming languages um, and then moved into research software engineering um, so uh, so yeah I'm quite I bring sort of quite a technical set of skills and, and perspectives to, to to this session um, I think maybe I'll ask David to introduce himself next and then hand over to Toby is that okay David sure uh, I'm David Palmquist, so I'm in the systems team at the Pollock Library at Cal State Fullerton. Um, so I've been with the Carpentries for about three years, and I only adopted Python after you know, starting to work at the library. Um, and I very much am sort of the um, enthusiast rather than the, you know, I don't do technical image processing for my job. It's more so just an interest in Python and then uh, branching out to imaging because it seemed like an interesting topic. Thanks, David. And then Toby, and Toby has a few slides after this. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Toby. I'm the director of curriculum at the Carpentries. So I'm a member of the Carpentries core team and I lead the curriculum team um, there. So I've been, my involvement with this this project has been to support um, Bob and David and Kimberly and Ulf, who are the other two maintainers who couldn't join this call today, um, in their development and, and maintenance of this lesson, um, trying to give a perspective from, I guess, curriculum design and um, carpentries um, uh, I don't know how to how to phrase this right. Trying to make sure that this is another curriculum that fits well within within the data carpentry lesson program, I suppose. Um, but my involvement with this particular curriculum started actually before I joined the core team, and I guess I can talk about that a little bit more in, when I go through the history and, and acknowledge some of the people who've contributed to the, the curriculum um, before this point as well. So. 
if you can move on to the first acknowledgement slide, Bob, please. Um, so the, the, the data carpentry image processing curriculum, I guess it, it's important to say right from the start that it, it's a single lesson that's designed to be taught in two days. And that lesson um, has its origins in, um, uh, in the USA, in the University of Nebraska, I think, um, where it was initially kind of designed and developed by Mark Meisenberg, um, Tessa Durham Brooks, Rachel Burks, and several other people involved in a project called DVAS um, there. They wrote the first kind of draft of the lesson. Um, it was using Python already, but was um, using a, a library for Python that interfaces with an, a piece of image processing software called OpenCV. Um, and they tested that initial draft of the lesson um, in Nebraska. And then the, this one of the kind of outcomes of that testing was a decision to switch to using the scikit-learn um, library, uh, sorry, the scikit image library, that should say. Um, that's my that's my fault. Sorry, um, the Psychic Image Library for for doing the image processing rather than than OpenCV, and two people at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory here in in Heidelberg, where I'm also calling from, um, uh, Dominic and Constantine, put a lot of time and effort into converting the existing lesson material into um, using Psychic Image. Um, Dominic. And then another colleague at Emble, uh, Gregor, went on to teach that version of the lesson using Psychic Image for the first time at Emble in Heidelberg. Um, and they were supported in that by Christian Tischer uh, and the Emble BioIT project. And the Emble BioIT project is the project I used to work on before I came to join the Carpentries. And so um, that's where my involvement, I guess, began with this lesson. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Um, and after that, um, Trisha Adamas and uh, Mark Meisenberg again um, taught a pilot at the University of Arizona um, with help from a long list of people whose names are on this slide. Um, uh, and that, that workshop was hosted by the Bio5 initiative, um, partnering with Cyverse, uh, the D7 Data Science Institute and the University of Arizona libraries. And I think there might be one more acknowledgement slide. So um, it was at this point, I guess, that we went through a period of sort of inactivity with this curriculum, um, where the focus of the curriculum team was elsewhere and the people who had initially been involved in the development of the lesson didn't have the, the time to devote to, to pushing it further. Um, and so at some stage, I think in 2020, we reached out to the wider carpentries community to try to find people who had image processing interest and experience who would be willing to come on board as maintainers, new maintainers of the lesson and to help us develop the lesson into a state where it was ready for beta testing. So beta testing being where we, we invite the wider community to come and, and, and try teaching it and give feedback. We'll talk more about, about what beta means um, soon. And so answering that call were David and Bob, who are here today, and um, Ulf and Kimberly as well. Um, and they took over then as maintainers and, and really continued to drive its development to the state that you find it in now. Um, and they've done this, this slide doesn't do justice to it, I think, but they've done really amazing work to, to bring it to the point that it's at. And I'm, I'm just in general extremely grateful and kind of proud to see where the lesson has got to and I'm really excited about what's happening now as we share it with the, with the wider carpentries community. Um, I also don't want to finish kind of acknowledging past effort without also mentioning the many other community members who've opened issues on the lesson repository and open pull requests to try to fix those issues and to, to improve the lesson in general. Those people um, 
have done that voluntarily and are not listed by name here, but it really makes a huge difference. And knowing that there's a community of people out there who are interested in contributing to this lesson and supporting its kind of development maintenance is really very encouraging. It's one of the things that we look for in a mature curriculum. Um, and then the final thank you that I will say is to my colleague, Erin Becker, um, who was originally in this role of kind of core team support to the developers of this lesson. Um, and to the other members of the Carpentries curriculum team who've also kind of helped to um, make sure that we can keep keep making progress with this. So that's a, a brief history and some thank yous to all of the people that have been involved up to this point. Um, and I hope that the other people that are on this call and that are watching this video are interested in continuing to contribute to that as we as we move forward with the with the next stages of the lesson. Um, ah, okay, so the next slide is about what a beta lesson is, so I guess I'll talk through that and then I think I, I um, hand back over to Bob afterwards. So I mentioned that this lesson is now in the kind of beta testing phase. Um, briefly, in the Carpentries, we, we think about the process of developing a new lesson in stages that, are, that we label similar to to how you might label the development stages of a software project so we talk about pre-alpha as a stage in which the kind of first draft of the lesson is still being written and it hasn't been taught at all yet and then when it starts to be taught for the first time by the people that wrote it um it enters what we call alpha testing so they take this lesson that they've written they try teaching it in a workshop they gather feedback and make notes about their experience of teaching it. And then they iterate on the lesson again, incorporating that feedback and making changes to try to improve it based on, on those, those alpha pilots. And after a few sort of iterations like that, um, the lesson moves into what we call beta testing, which is then where we invite um, members of the community, instructors who have not really up to that point been very involved in the development of the lesson to try teaching it and then to provide feedback to the maintainers and the developers about what worked and what didn't work um, so that they can continue to improve it further. Um, and so that's where this lesson's at now. And I guess to complete the, the story, um, after a few iterations of that kind of beta testing, when we can feel confident that the lesson's really ready for wider consumption um, by the by the instructor community, we can mark it stable. And in terms of a new official lesson um, within data carpentry, in this case, a lesson entering stable means that it is then ready to be requested by whoever wants to request a, a centrally organized workshop to be um organized by the carpentries team and, and delivered by instructors wherever they are um, and so that's why we go through this kind of process of really making sure that a lesson's ready because we want to be confident that when someone asks us to organize a workshop teaching that lesson we'll be able to do it and that it will go well um, when the workshop happens so because this lesson's in beta uh, what that means is that we think it is ready for people to teach without causing any major problems but um, you should still, as an instructor, taking this lesson on for the first time, um, exercise some caution while approaching that, um, that teaching. So there may be bugs, there may be um, unexpected things that could happen, um, and there may be parts of the lesson that, that need better explanation, they need more explanation that are missing something important or whatever. And, and it's really those things that we, that are why we're running these beta pilot workshops to try to gather feedback on those things to make sure that we can polish up the lesson and improve it further so that it's ready for everybody else. And so we've actually got two beta pilot workshops lined up at this point, I'm, I'm happy to say, but um, Honestly, I think it wouldn't hurt to have a third one, for example. So if you're watching this or if you're attending this call and you would be interested in hosting or teaching a beta pilot of this lesson, um, please do get in touch with me. And I especially want to extend that invitation to anyone 
in regions of the world other than Western Europe and North America, because those are the two regions that we already have beta pilots happening in. And it's really important that we get kind of a diverse set of perspectives and, and audiences um, for these beta pilots to make sure that the lessons is accessible to as many people as possible when it's um, when it enters that stable stage. Um, perhaps before I hand over to Bob, what questions do you have about this beta testing phase and the life cycle that I described of lessons in general? Okay, that was a sufficiently long, awkward silence. I'll hand over to you, Bob, uh, from here, I think. Thanks, Toby. Um, so I'm going to go through a few slides that kind of motivate um, the, the, the lesson. Um, and then I'll start going through sort of episode by episode uh, on the content. We have a, um, a sort of optional breakout at that stage. Um, I think probably splitting into smaller groups is, is, is unwise, but we use that pause to um, again, see what questions people have uh, and to give my my sort of co-hosts an opportunity to react to what I'm saying and um, you know, see if there are, are, are different perspectives on that. So the, the first question. Uh, Bob, <laughs> we were teaching, um, sorry. Bob, I'm sorry. Uh, your, your audio is a little broken up. Maybe try turning off your video. OK, certainly. Um, Thank you. Uh, does that sound any better, please? Uh, it does. Yes, thank it you. It does. OK, great. Um, thanks for letting me know about that. And if there are any more problems, do do leap in and, and, and let me know. Um, so the first the first sort of question to address is why um, why teach this lesson? Why is this lesson sort of uh, important and, and useful uh, in the context of the other? The other uh, materials that are out there. So images are um, images are everywhere. And digital images are uh, increasingly available uh, as uh, as research uh, materials. So it's it's um, a type of data that people increasingly want to be able to to deal with and work with in a variety of contexts. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and the other thing that I I would say that makes this lesson uh, important, kind of different and worth worth looking at is that uh, image data uh, requires different handling to uh, to data that appears in in data frames that you might load in from a, uh, a CSV file where you has we have data in in columns and various rows. Uh, whereas, uh, image data tends to be uh, better represented as arrays and matrices. It's a little bit um, a little different and requires different different handling and needs to be thought about differently. So to address that, what's in the lesson? Uh, in summary, and I'll go into I'll go into much more detail. Uh, on this, hopefully a sort of useful level of detail to give you a tour of the content um, without actually delivering the content or being too superficial uh, as we go on. But what's in the lesson? Uh, an introduction to images in research. So where do um, I, I've learned a bit about how different research areas make use of images. So I'm obviously I have a sort of limited uh, narrow perspective on that from my specific research. Uh, we talk quite a lot about how images are represented by computers, um, how that's sort of different to our kind of natural perception of vision. Uh, we introduce software tools for for working with images. So uh, Psyche Image, as Toby mentioned, and NumPy. Um, so we, we need we need these tools and we need to explain to people how to use the tools um, in order that they can achieve their, their research goals and answer their research questions. Um, and sort of related to that, we, um, we look at uh, manipulating images using software, 
doing various different operations on them and ultimately sort of extracting data and statistics from images, which is what we need to be able to do to be quantitative in answering research questions based on, on image data. So this slide here is either somewhat acute or quite quite profound. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I've included it. It um, uh, pertains to an aspect of the, the lesson, which is how do we, how do we think about uh, image data and how, are, how is the image data stored in computers? So uh, this image says uh, this, is, this is not a pipe. And uh, the, the point is that it's, uh, it's, not, it's not an actual pipe. It's, uh, it's a representation of a, of a pipe. It's an image of a pipe. So this is either a bit, as I say, a bit of juice, or it's quite profound in that um, this is uh, the way it, it, it may not may not ever have been an individual phys physical object. This it's a it's an abstraction and it's a representation and it's now stored in a computer in a particular way. Um, and and that kind of uh, creates limits in what we can do with it and how we deal with it. Uh, and it means we have to understand sort of what those limits are and what what the differences are between and for some people this might be completely intuitive but I, I think it's a fairly a fairly critical thing when I was learning about uh, about this that sort of realization that this really is a bit different to our our perception and, and looking at images we, we we can be quite intuitive when we look at them and um, things are uh, things are different uh, in in the context of uh, of an image on a page or stored in a in a computer. So in order to be able to understand this, we need the lesson to get across some important concepts in uh, in how images are are stored and represented in computers, um, and to be able to. I guess make sure we all have the same language to be able to talk about these things and to understand what these concepts are to a sort of level of depth that people go away from to be able to sort of use them and apply them to the research area. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick up a bit more on some of these as I go through the subsequent slides and look at things in more detail. Um, but the concepts include um, pixels and arrays and coordinates. So how we, um, how the uh, individual elements of an image and their um, color is represented in the computer. So we can we can access that. Uh, so with with channels, and then um, some other some other terminology and concepts uh, kernels, which is tied up with. Uh, filtering and blurring images, we explain why that's important and masking images as well. So to do with how we um, address various subsets of the data in the image uh, to be able to uh, ask questions about the things that we're interested in and ignore the background, the things that we are, are not so interested in. What's not in the Latin, I, I didn't, not, not being negative here, but I felt that it was important to, to pick this pick this up uh, because it's such a, an important topic in itself is use of artificial intelligence and deep learning to uh, extract data from images and make predictions based on images. Uh, this is a really important area, uh, hugely prevalent in research. This, this lesson, I think, might well serve people interested in getting into AI and deep learning um, in terms of the basics of being able to handle images and knowing what you're dealing with, I think it might be quite important. Uh, but this lesson is, uh, I guess, a more traditional approach to, um, uh, to image analysis. Uh, it means it's inherently easier to explain how one did the image analysis and got to, got to one's results. Uh, AI and deep, this is a criticism leveled of, uh, against um, AI and deep learning approaches. Um, and, and this uh, is not always valid, but we won't get into that. Uh, the, 
this is also potentially a less data intensive so you don't need lots and lots of images to be able to do the things that we're talking about in this lesson uh, you can you can do something useful in terms of extracting information from a single part of a single image um, and there's also so i guess pragmatic reasons you can't cover can't cover everything in, in one lesson so into the uh, the content of the, the lesson of We'll pause in a, a few seconds time to see what people happen to give them an opportunity to react and see if uh, there are any sort of differences in opinion on what I've been saying. Um, in terms of prerequisite skills for, for learners, um, the there are a couple of things. So uh, bash uh, shell skills. I don't think... Uh, you need to know a great deal. Um, you might even be able to do this with with, uh, with minimal to no bash skills, having worked through the, the lesson the other week. Um, this is mostly about being able to get access to the, uh, the data. And then we sort of move everything into Jupyter Notebooks uh, for like, the whole of the lesson content so um so you can't live your whole life in jupyter notebooks you have to kind of pop in and out to be able to do certain things so so some bash skills but i don't think you have to be a real uh, have have to have enormous proficiency in bash um python uh so python to work in the in the notebooks python is the language that we use um to um uh to work with images in this in this lesson, we make heavy use of uh, of NumPy. Uh, so um, I guess quite possible to know a great deal of Python without actually using, depending on your background, without using having come across NumPy at all. Um, I think we kind of uh, explain a fair bit of NumPy and how arrays work in, in in that context in the lesson itself. But I just wanted to mention that that here that. Uh, it's quite NumPy heavy in terms of the Python. Um, and then the setup instructions. So what are we asking or what would you be asking learners to do before they can actually get going uh, with the lesson? Um, and the data for the lesson is not in the, the lesson repository. It's in share. Uh, so you, you download... Um, zip file or tar file from from figshare uh, and that you have to do that first and sort of unpack it and uh, and, and put it somewhere um, which is quite a smooth experience and then as i say we're using jupyter notebooks for or executing all of the commands um, so the way to the way to get that is to download anaconda uh, which works on linux mac windows and the anaconda allows it does a whole bunch of things uh, in terms of being a package manager and, a, and virtual environments we're not we're not using any of that or getting into any of the complexity of that there's a there's a base environment with a bunch of stuff pre-installed and that has everything that's that's needed for this lesson um i guess i would say for people not used to working with with notebooks, there can be there can be a bit of an adjustment if you're used to running Python scripts. Uh, the notebooks will sort of maintain the state, to use the jargon, will, will store the values of variables between runs in a way that scripts don't. So, if you're used to notebooks, you'll be used to all of that. If, you, if you're not, then um, there may be some um, some behaviour that you're not expecting. Okay, so I'll just do a couple of slides getting into the um, uh, the content of the, uh, the the lesson episode by episode, and then we'll pause and, and see. I'll see if there are any questions in the Etherpad and and see what questions people have and, and, and ask for, for reactions. Uh, so, so the introduction episode is quite short and uh, seeks to. Uh, look at what research questions can be answered with with image processing and i I, re I really hope that the content of the lesson is 
uh, you know, the examples are engaging for a wide range of people um, and that the, the skills that people are learning are going to be for a broad range of research questions. I think that, that what has been designed early on has been, has been quite with regards to that. So uh, examples include imaging a, imaging a black hole, um, there's so uh, astronomy, uh, astrophysics, I, I guess. Um, the uh, none of these research areas are things that I'm an expert in. Uh, uh, ec ecological questions, um, looking at uh, presumably looking at stuff imagery. So, uh, this is one of the things that I love about image analysis that sometimes the same techniques apply whether you're looking at something that's come out of uh, the highest resolution microscope you can imagine or the. The, the most fantastic telescope or satellite uh, or or even from a sort of from a smartphone camera like these same techniques can can be transferred across so we've got examples specific examples there from from astronomy uh, ecology zoology i guess um apologies if i'm misrepresenting this uh and from sort of biomedicine and then the introduction also begins to talk about this idea of of morphometrics uh, so what I guess what the, the ultimate kind of goal is with images is you take you're taking something that is an, a, a really rich piece of data in terms of the information that's in it and you want to get specific uh, numbers out so you can compare something that's going on in one set of images to something that's going on in another set of images and, and morphometrics is about um, once you've sort of split the image up uh, and and got hold of the objects that you're interested in uh, addressing, you can ask questions about their sort of shape and their size, and use that to to make your comparisons. Uh, so it sort of introduces that, and we'll come back to that in some later slides as well, because because we get into much more more detail on that. So this is just in the introduction. We're just sort of setting this up. Okay, um, this was where we were going to perhaps have a breakout. Um, I guess uh, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll first ask uh, Toby and David whether they have anything to add to that first section, if that's okay. I think that was great. Um, I guess before we start discussing the breakout questions I'd be interested to hear if anyone has any questions I guess from what you've already talked through but David might have something to add uh, um, I guess so I was just curious because you drew attention to the the difference between the like the typical data frame and the image data but I also found it interesting to me that there is almost like this connection. Like for me, it was like a light bulb moment when it felt like the image was made up of still data frames. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts on that or could expand on that idea of its difference for sameness. Um, so I guess the way I think about things, which is not gonna be the way that, that everybody thinks about things and this is not the comparison between if there is a comparison between data frames and, and arrays I don't think comes up too much in the lesson this is my my personal observation um, so the thing about an, an array or a matrix which is how an, an image is stored is to me at least there is a sort of significance in the arrangement of the pieces of data in that array so if a if a if something is next to another element in an array then that has significance um in in and, and in a, a data frame that kind of that kind of doesn't generally matter so the order in which the columns are to frame or the order in which the rows are generally doesn't matter um enormously generally so that's where i that's where i kind of see the difference in in handling them 
uh, it comes from and, and, and the sort of thing that's in between might be a, some time series data where you just have a, a list of numbers and, and there's a gap in time between us. So that was my, my thinking, but that, that, I mean, that could be an unhelpful way of thinking for, for, for others. Is that helpful, David? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, that, that's a, a striking difference between the two, even though it's it's somewhat the same, but then the positioning relative to each other is so important. So thank you. Okay. Um, so questions that we're, um, I guess these are the break questions with things people people might be interested in, in thinking about obviously it's quite a small group so I don't want to sort of pressurize people oh we've got a, got a question from uh, Florian uh, I was just wondering um, you, um, I think Toby touched on it uh, uh, slightly why did you choose scikit image to use as a basis um, so that wasn't I wasn't involved at the time that that decision was made. I can certainly speak for Psyche Image, but Toby might be able to um, help with that, or maybe not. Yeah, we moved away from the CV2, I think it is, library for working with OpenCV um, to Psyche Image, I guess, because Psyche Image is. Um, appeared to be more stable and easier to um, install for people um, and better documented in our experience as well. Um, so it was easier for people to find help after a workshop if they learned about Psychic Image than it might be if they were continuing to work with OpenCV. I think those were the main points. And the installation is is more. I might mention this already. The installation was more straightforward. Uh, Liz, hello. Um, I'm I'm here, I suppose, as a as a bit of a meta. My my interest in this um, lesson is because people have um, uh, asked um, my organisation, the ARDC, if we were interested in um, developing materials and guides for image, specifically for image analysis. So I'm, I'm looking to see if this is a, a lesson that I can um, direct some of our new instruct, um, instructor trainees to start um, looking into. Um, I, I actually just wanted to make a comment that I think this is a really useful um, lesson because it provides the opportunity for that multidiscipline um, uh, crossover in, in that it, by sharing um, curriculum on image analysis, you have the ability to test it against different audiences, different uh, research focuses. Um, I, yeah, I'm really excited about it. It looks great. Thanks for that. Um... Yeah, I, 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 as I said before, I really like the kind of cross disciplinarity uh, of it, um, and would be really interested to to see how the next pieces go. Are there are there any? Does, does anyone have other questions or remarks at, at at this point on the the content of the talk? Okay. Um, I think I'm, I'm struggling on Zoom to see sort of the, how many people we have. Um, I think, um, I don't know, Toby, do you think it's, do you think we should encourage people to use the Etherpad to um, at, to answer the, the breakout questions if they'd like to and, and give people a couple of minutes to do that? Is that a good good thing at this point? I think that would be a really good idea. I'll just add some empty bullet points underneath each question. So at the moment, the um, the questions that were intended for breakout one are starting at line 109. Um, so if you head to the Etherpad, I'll post the link into the chat one more time, um, then you might write some notes um, 
on your answers to those questions um, in there. And then we can, what do you think? We'll give um, five minutes for that. And then we can try to discuss some of the things that come up there afterwards, Bob. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds fantastic. All right, I'm going to set a five minute timer going and then when the ducks start to quack, then I'll let you all know. <laughs> ducks, okay.
Okay, so the ducks have done a quacking. Um, let's, I guess, Bob, it looks like most people have stopped typing. So looking through, was there anything in particular you wanted to call attention to or to discuss in more detail? Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, the, the social sciences humanities perspective, because that's really something that I don't know very much about. And since becoming a research software engineer and trying to uh, work with um, work with this possible range of researchers, really, this is this is kind of interesting to, uh, to me. I'm really pleased to see that um, that perspective raised uh david did you have any uh, thoughts on uh, any of the responses uh i nothing but that did catch my eye that the the humanities stuff because it is a very interesting question and it's also i have a background in anthropology and linguistics so i'm i'm perplexed by it but interested <laughs> Certainly, yeah. So the the digital humanities at the University of Sheffield has some research software engineers in in, in there They're using doing um, digitization of uh, of manuscripts and annotating using language processing. So it's quite. I think it's it's just huge. Um, yeah. Um, I guess some so, of the. It, sorry, do you mind if I if I jump in? Um, of course. It's interesting. Nobody, I didn't either. Nobody mentioned um, like ethics, I guess, as a challenge, um, like ethical considerations of, of image processing. And I guess it depends really a lot on your domain and the kinds of questions you're interested in answering with these kinds of methods. But there was another session in Carpentry Con um, all, that already happened that was about um covering topics of like data literacy and data ethics in carpentry lessons and that set me to thinking about what kinds of um uh discussions we might want to have in an image processing lesson along those lines as well um i don't think that there's much about ethical image processing in the lesson yet, but it might be something that we should think about adding. Yes, as we as we take an increasingly broad view of what image data might be and, and what research areas, it becomes in, in increasingly important, I think. Um, okay. I'd absolutely hope people should feel welcome to continue to um, to add to these. Uh, hopefully, you, it, it's useful to to everyone to see what the people in the call are um, are working on, and it's really useful uh, for the maintainers uh, going forwards. Um, particularly looking at some of the the, the the potential the potential challenges. Some of them might be addressed by the content that I go subsequent slides um and some of them so i think i think what i'll do now is uh is move on and talk about the remainder of the the lesson content and then we'll stop again for questions um uh towards the end of that uh so there's a, there'll be a bit of me a bit of me talking next uh, okay, so the uh, first episode um, that I'd uh, the introduction, and we, we sort of stopped after that. And um, at this point, we're now getting into uh, the uh, the more technical content of the of the lesson. And the first part of it is. Uh, called image basics and this relates to what i was saying about how 
uh, images are represented uh, in computers, how, how computers kind of sort of think about and store uh, images. And this is kind of the foundation for uh, doing some of the more uh, in-depth stuff and answering research questions further on in the, in the lesson. Uh, so the, the content covered is on uh, sort of images, arrays and pixels and matrices, and just trying to get this idea of what the relationship between these things is um, clear. Uh, and also um, on uh, a, a lot of the, I know we've we've had in the this 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 discussion we've we've got people talking about um, sort of various different types of multi-channel images. The it's it's red, green, blue channel uh, images that we uh, we talk about mostly in the lesson, um, and I think that that's it's left to the to the um, further work for people to sort of expand that concept out. So we'll talk a bit about how um uh sort of optical photography type images are represented we also talk about file formats and compression um so uh it's saving images in certain formats can cause some of the data in there to be lost or kind of blurred or, or, or fudged i suppose for one of a, a a better word um so it's we're making learners aware of that and, and perhaps some of the pitfalls there at that point. Uh, so, so yeah, this is the, uh, this is the, the, um, the first sort of critical point. I'll try and make that a bit, a bit bigger. Oh, zoom. Oh, zoom. Yeah. Okay. A bit, a bit. This is like the fundamental thing. Um, if we if we think about this as having sort of zoomed in on an image, um, go in, we go in close enough, and we start to see these things that are the pixels with the the hard edges, these squares. Um, so yeah, if you if you zoom in far enough, then. Uh, image on the computer in the computer and the computer's memory is represented by these these little blocks um, and they are laid out in a square or in a rectangle uh, and each of the blocks uh, just has a just has a number associated which which sort of says how strong the color or how intense the um, uh, the light is at a particular point in the image um, what we can see in this sort of representation, you can see how the the numbers that are stored in the computer relate to the intensity of the color of each of these 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 blocks on this scale. So, if it's a really high number, it's a really sort of bright color up at the top, and if it's a really low number, then it's it's really dark. And this is kind of fundamental how computers get between uh, numbers and a visual representation of an image that is uh, intuitively understandable by, by people looking at the screen. Um, so we sort of go into this and we, we talk about um, what, is a, what is a pixel and how a pixel relates to um, an element in an array or a piece of data in, in a matrix and how um, uh, sort of the relationship between uh, between images and arrays, which is pretty pretty much the image is, is stored as an array. Um, so I'm ba battling a little with, oh, I can move that there. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a key, a key point that this is how this is how the computer is is storing the uh, uh, the image, and this un this unlocks um, the uh, the sort of capability to analyze and extract data from images by um, by treating them as arrays and using the tools that we use to work with arrays.
Um, and uh, and also talk about um, multi-channel images in terms of images that have a red channel, a green channel, uh, and a blue channel. Uh, so uh, they're quite small on on here, but I can I can make these a little bit bigger to look at them. So this is an image with uh, with sort of multiple colours. So again, this idea of sort of being really zoomed in. Uh, and, and, and you can see the edges of the pixels. And each of these is, is sort of equivalent to an L in an array of the same, sort of four by four array or a four by four matrix. Um, and in order to get this enormous range of different possible colors, you can get these by um, just finding uh, amounts of red, green, and blue. Um, so you end up with, uh, uh, this is where things fall down because my color vision doesn't work very well. Um, but uh, the, um, you can see, I think this is it's kind of more bluish um, and it's because it's got sort of more blue uh, in this pixel and, and less of red and green in the other pixels. Or maybe I've, uh, maybe I've got that wrong. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we extend the idea of having uh, a, a sort of two-dimensional array with these numbers representing the intensity of the values in the pixels to um, uh, a three-dimensional array, um, and it gets quite the 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 array handling and the array and matrix terminology gets kind of complicated quite quickly. Um, so uh, we have a three-dimensional array which has these three channels: a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. You can address um, elements in uh, to coordinates in space and also the um, the different color channels. So hopefully I'm across in the time I have to in a sort of intuitive way in the time that I have here. But the the idea is that the lesson uh, is is getting that across and explaining it. Um, in an accessible and sort of intuitive way. Um, Bob, yeah. before you continue, well, we mm -hmm. had talked about taking a break in the middle of this session um, yeah. because two hours is quite long. Yeah. And this seems like before you get started talking about the working with psychic image um, episode, this seems like it might be a good moment. Sounds good to me. Um, what do you think? It's three minutes past the hour now. Should we? break for seven minutes, let's say, and come back at, at 10 minutes past. Yeah, that's great from my perspective, if it's OK from from such. Eva, is that OK with you as facilitator? That sounds great, yeah. All right, then thanks, everybody. We'll come back in. Um, Do you we'll come back at 11 recording? minutes past the hour. Um, and I'll mm. pause the recording. Yeah, thank you for suggesting that. Shall I? Shall I begin again? Uh, yes, please. Cool. I'll do that. Yeah, I think I feel like I was falling into the trap of uh, trying to like really explain quite a lot of detail of um, uh, what was going on just before we had the break. So all I'm all I'm, I must remember that what I'm trying to do here is give people a tour through explain what the content is and, and sort of why it's there rather than actually trying to deliver the about there a bit. Um, so uh, we were just talking about the basics of images, um, how images are represented in computers as arrays slash matrices. Um, the next episode, uh, we talk a bit about uh, working with psychic image or S SK image um, as it's or skimage, I suppose, uh, as as it's represent as it may be uh, may be written. Uh, so there's a, a a question I think: Why if images are arrays in computers? Then why can't we just use NumPy, which is our kind of go-to thing in Python for dealing with arrays? Um, and there's a there's there's some some reasons for that. Um, one is that uh, as someone mentioned in the discussion earlier, uh, images can come in some unusual formats and uh, Scikit image has some functionality for letting us uh, load and save images in a range of different formats. 
which is which is one motivation to do it. And then there are some things that you might want to do with images that you probably wouldn't want to do with with lots of other types of arrays, such as uh, I've picked out the example here of scaling, of, of resizing an image where data ends up being uh, averaged out to have more pixels in the image than you had to begin with when you're scaling it up, or you have less pixels when you're scaling it down, you're losing information that, that are not typically things that you would want to do with an array, a, a sort of generic array, which is why they're in scikit image and not in um, NumPy. Um, in this episode, uh, we also cover quite a lot of um, array manipulation uh, and subsetting uh, just using pure uh, NumPy, which are things that could be applied to, to any uh, uh, so sort of subsetting, getting different regions, uh, extract crop. It's kind of like analogous to cropping, uh, cropping an image if you've if you've ever done that. Um, but also finding uh, areas of the image where there's particular values, so particularly bright areas or areas that have a particular color, um, and that's important in being able to. Uh, image down into individual regions that we can then use to uh, uh, ask questions of and uh, address address research questions so that episode is on working with uh, with scikit image and with numpy subsequently uh, we look at um, uh, Taking, creating an image from scratch. So uh, creating a sort of em empty image and uh, drawing. And, and again, this, this is functionality that's in scikit image that you that is not something that comes up in normal, uh, normally working with arrays. So being able to kind of draw lines and shapes and write text onto an image, um, which is of a it's kind of fun and uh, and it sort of helps with understanding the image coordinate system um, and how one can affect that. Uh, but the, the real utility of it in terms of being able to um, extract data from images is in masking. So again, this is kind of analogous to cropping. Uh, so which, which of the image are things that I want to include in my analysis and which bits of the image do I, do I want to ignore? And being able to do that, if, if, if I continue with a sort of crop analogy, to be able to do that with quite with arbit almost arbitrarily complex shapes. Um, so if you, have, if you want to look at a circular region, then giving people the, uh, the skills they need to be able to extract that sort of region from, from an image. Uh, in episode five, um, we look at, uh, at creating sort of intensity histograms from images. So this is a way of taking sort of all of the data uh, in, in the image and uh, plotting, seeing how, how many um, pixels have a particular uh, particular intensity or particular color values so sort of one way of looking at sort of ignoring all of the the spatial information the relationship between where the pixels are and just treating every every pixel every point in the image as a as as a um as just a piece of data uh, and plotting a histogram of that so counting up how many fall into how many have uh, zero to one intensity one to two etc across the histogram um, and this this can be kind of useful in itself in telling us what the uh, intensities are of the different colors of the image uh, if it's a color image but it's also really useful when we come on to talk about thresholding in which we are interested in splitting up the image based on the intensity of a particular color um, 
or the, the overall intensity of the image. This is this is useful and it kind of builds towards the um, the final episodes where we're able to apply all of these things to start answering questions. Um, the next episode is on uh, blurring images. So this uh, the question of why blur an image? Why if you have a if you have a um, a perfectly crisp image that you've acquired with uh, with great effort from your, your telescope or your microscope or from any other uh, by any other means, why would you then want to to blur it? Um, and the answer to that is is often around removing background noise and in a, the analysis to address owners the objects in the image that that are of a size that uh, that you're you're interested in so that's that's often the reason why 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 this would be included in the process of steps that you would use in in analyzing an image um, and we go to some effort in there's a lot of sort of terminology in here um, and we we go to some effort in terms of uh, uh, disambiguating what what blurring means, what filtering is, um, and what sort of com the relationship between blurring and filtering and convolution um, and, and kernels. So we try and explain all of that and make that clear um, in, in this episode. And also, so why, why do it? What's the relationship? But also how to do it, how to use scikit image to um, uh, do bring using different types of filters and different types of kernels focusing on the gaussian gaussian kernel and yeah this is uh just illustrating uh the effect of uh of blurring it's not it, this is purely illustrative it's not doing anything enormously useful um in these uh in these images uh, but that's that's kind of the the things that we get into of the lesson. Um, moving into to episode seven, um, thresholding. So we've kind of talked a little bit about this earlier on in terms of taking all of the pixels in an image that are ab above a certain uh, level, a certain intensity, and looking at them and doing analysis on them. Um, so we we get more here in terms of what thresholding is, um, and this is uh, if you're familiar with with sort of analyzing images, this is a really often a really important step. Often this is kind of your first step in separating separating out the the background of the image from the the bits of the image that you're interested in, and um, and and thus isolating the different objects in the image that you're interested in looking at um, and we talk about thresholding in terms of being able to just uh, come up with an, a number that you want to use as a threshold and use that as the threshold and i think we also mention um, some aut an automated thresholding method as well um, which can be good if you're working with images uh, where the intensity values are different between between images um, and this if you if you're not familiar and I'm, if with what this achieves this is what I was sort of describing a, a second ago um, in this example uh, everything so these these white areas here when they're represented in the computer they're going to have a really a really high number associated with them. So we basically say uh, everything that uh, these, these gray bits are going to have lower numbers. So with a with a threshold, we can say um, everything that is below a certain number, a certain intensity, uh, is kind of in. Uh, it's going to be included, and, and everything that is above that number is not going to be included, and that that reduces what we're 
we're dealing with down to something like this objects so these are the things that we're interested in here the, the, the squares and the triangles and such like are all uh labeled here with one color in white and then the the background the stuff that we're not interested in um is, is labeled in black and i think I, I think at this point to me it begins to kind of um explains why why we were talking about histograms a few episodes ago um in order to be a, one of the important things with that is in order to be able to select the right threshold to use when uh, when trying to do things like this and as we go through the next couple of episodes we hopefully we, we begin to see the value of doing this in terms of how it can help our analyses um when we get into this i think which is the penultimate episode i think talking about connect, connected components we can then see how our our thresholding and our understanding of histograms and intensity in images and how how pixels work and how arrays work has led to us leads to us being able to label each of the objects in the image individually and here they're all represented by uh by a set by a different color um so uh, once we get to that point we can start extracting uh, useful information from these and hopefully we see the analogy between these kind of basic geometric shapes and images where um, in research where there's all kinds of um, more interesting objects uh, that we want to look at so um, as I say this this is the point once once we've got to this so connected components just to briefly explain like each of these would be um sort of con individual connected components um and they're separated out from this in terms of the sort of pixel values this is white and this is white they're the same color i kind of can't tell them apart um and what scikit image does is sort of look well is are these pixels connected to these ones and these ones connected to these ones so i'm going to group all these together because they're all connected together but they're not connected to this upside down house shape next to it so um, psychic image is able to distinguish uh, on, on, between the different objects on that basis and once once it can do that uh, we start in statistics on these these objects um, and, and the sort of the way that this this example goes is you can see that um, if you can see my mouse, if not, there's um, there's some circles around these. We've not just identified these big shapes that we're interested in, but we've also got these um, these little bits of specks of dust as well, which we're not interested in. And in this, the the plot on the left, the areas histogram. Um, we can see that we've got four objects with a really small area um, and then a lot of other objects, seven I think it is in this image, with a larger area. So we, we're rapidly now to the point where we're able to get numbers out on the objects in our image and we're able to use that. In this case, we, we're able to use it to um, improve our sort of analysis steps that we're building up and say, well, we're going to exclude those small objects from the analysis. We'll put another threshold in and we'll exclude them from the analysis. Um, but we can start to see, get uh, valuable research data, hopefully, um, from, from the objects in the image. Uh, and in this lesson, we talk, we, we unpack that a bit in terms of uh, Talking about morphometrics again, which we we talked about right at the start, and so once we've got once we've got to this point, it's a great point to be at, uh, and everything is kind of labelled, and we can call it. Color. We can ask, we can get a huge range of different properties uh, of these various different objects. So we talked about area. In the previous slide but we could look at perimeter we could look at center so we can look at the position of the objects in relation to each other um, we can look at the the color intensity of the individual regions 
uh, and we can we can start to imagine all sorts of uh, comparisons that we can make in order to be able to better out and compare one image with another or compare one image in an one object in an image with another object in an image um, and it really opens out here in terms of what you can imagine doing i think um, and at the end the, the final episode there's uh, a challenge and what that does is it uh, uh, it is a challenge that requires us to be able to put together um, their own program uh, to do image analysis um, and it uses the example of, of colonies of, of bacteria on uh, on on plates on agar plates so that's how you grow kind of grow bacteria in a lab uh, basically is it they, they just appear as blobs in an image and the the challenge is to count the number of blobs um, but in order to be able to do you need to be able to apply knowledge of how images are represented uh, and, and being able to subset and address things and treat images as arrays you need to be able to blur um, images to get rid of noise to get rid of the, the background blobs load and save images etc um, apply thresholding and um, uh, do this connected component analysis to be able to then count the colonies uh, so that that final episode kind of synthesizes everything and gets people to apply what they've learned so includes a very fast-paced tour through the content of the lesson um perhaps the first thing to do is to ask toby and david whether there's anything that they would have explained uh differently or that i've I, i've given the time constraints that I've had to explain it. <laughs> no, I think you did an excellent job. Okay. Um, and I guess I guess more importantly then the thing to do is to ask uh, the others in the audience whether there's anything that they'd uh, they they'd like to ask at this point. So what what questions do, do people have on the 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 uh, content of the episodes? Sorry, I was just shutting my window because there's a lorry outside. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, maybe maybe you can expand a bit. I was wondering about a couple of things. Um, so you always talk about um, basically this convention, let's call it like that, with, that we work with RGB pictures. Um, so the, did you kind of intentionally leave out the notion of color spaces? Um, first, you uh, because... Um, I think somewhere in your agenda you had the notion of compression where color spaces play a big role. We think of JPEG and maybe it's also relevant for uh, certain measurement devices whose uh, sensors are more uh, are, are working in, in uh, different ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, and thereby uh, kind of give, give out dif different color spaces anyway, maybe. That would be one question. So uh, th thanks for that. Um, I am. Uh, I absolutely uh, yeah. I understand the 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 question and um, as a sort of design decision for, from the course. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, what the uh, I can speculate as to why the decision was made to. Um, deal just with RGB, but I don't know, Toby, do you, was, was this something that you remember being discussed early, earlier on or? Yeah, I mean, it's been a, I don't think we have the perfect balance on this necessarily. Um, certainly one of the pieces of feedback that, that we got most in the pilot workshop that happened at Emble with the lesson was the, um, the folks there were much more likely to be dealing with um, like intensity values between zero and one in channels that weren't necessarily R, G and B, right? And so 
the focus on RGB was not necessarily helpful to them compared to to what else we could have done. Um, I can't speak too much to the mm. concept, I guess, of color spaces and so on, because that's a bit too much in the technical details of, of image processing and outside of my experience. But um, the feeling, I think, in the end was that we we would stick with with RGB values because they work reasonably well to introduce the general concept of multiple channels that you can consider individually or consider in combination. Um, and the learners arriving at this workshop may arrive with some familiarity with the concept of RGB already from, from elsewhere. Um, but I think it's one of the things I'm really interested in. In I think we sort of concluded that we needed to gather more perspectives from more instructors and more audiences to decide on what the best balance is for this. So I'm not completely answering your question there, Florian, but I, I, I guess I want to stress that none of this is completely settled. And in fact, it's sort of the point in doing this kind of testing. Sounds reasonable. So it's probably one of the notes that either the instructor can adapt uh, to his audience at that point, if, uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a similar experience as you made in your workshop, that the people are just working in different color spaces, or also, well, the instructor probably has to be familiar with the notion of color concepts by itself. So if you work in RGB space, it's the entry, the barrier of entry is less. So sounds reasonable. Um, sim kind of a similar question. Um, uh, uh, well, so you did um, you uh, the that um, uh, do you introduce uh, so do, do you stress somewhere that images are always gathered by devices and usually you always have to deal with the um, with the uh, limitations of these devices uh, in 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 um, uh, at, at some points uh, to uh, I'm asking that question to. Um, uh, and bring this up since I think it's useful that people uh, are aware that um, there are limit uh, that there are limitations on the data that they gathered imposed by them from the from their observational devices, the resolution they have, the processing the device is doing by itself within within um, its its image capture stage, um, these kinds of things. So that's a, a, again. Thanks for that. I think that's a that's a really good point we do talk about um using filters and blurring to kind of de denoise things but uh i think what you what you've uh ad addressed there is that, that there's a whole bunch of uh distortions and things that different devices and, and different optics can do uh so so yeah i don't think we um I don't think we go into that in 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 it's certainly not a big part of the the courses it stands as far as i'm aware uh, toby you were going to add to that yeah well one of the things that you mentioned and i remember us talking about this on the on the github issue as well was um about doing things like resizing an image and then potentially adding new values in between the like coordinates when you make an image bigger. And we talked about how we need to include a warning, I guess, in the lesson, the any values that get added in, like algorithmically by doing something like that are not real data, if you see what I mean. Um, they've been guessed effectively by the software. And I think that that's another opportunity here to talk about how if you find that really in the end, the image data that you're working with isn't a, a good enough sort of resolution to answer the questions that you want to ask, then that's really a problem of the instrumentation that was used to collect the images rather than something that can be solved by post-processing, um, like making the image artificially larger, if you see what I mean. Because I think this is, again, it touches on the kind of data ethics considerations that that I think could be included in this lesson but it's really important to to stress to an audience of researchers in particular that like just because python 
empowers you to do like enables you to do these things with image data doesn't necessarily mean that you should be doing them yeah thanks uh, yeah, yeah so um and uh, some in kind of in a similar direction but now from the other end of the uh yeah um image uh using scale uh the notion of psychological perception that or it's uh um it's, all, uh, it's always humans who look at uh, uh pictures and try to interpret them and that this this in, this in turn has uh, has its own uh, plethora in terms of the uh, um, uh, its own implications in terms of the image formats that are available today. We we all know we all know why JPEG is the way it is. Um, yeah, I could could you could you um, could you expand on that at all? I'm not I'm not sh sure. Oh, so uh, yeah, okay. Um, so if you think in terms of uh, uh, comp uh, in terms of compression, you touched uh, touched upon that. Mm -hmm. uh, then you ask yourself the question: What is the useful information in a picture that okay. uh, that that, you, that needs to be available? And the, the JPEG does uh, the two the two big the, the three big types of changes that JPEG is doing. The familiar JPEG format that every camera and every smartphone is able to spit out. First, uh, you have the um, uh, the color space conversion in an intensity and uh, um, color difference for, for, for way of format, and then you subsample the color information since the since the human eye is more uh, uh, sensitive to the green channel in, in, in contrast to other channels. Therefore, you have less resolution in those um, in those color spaces. The next, uh, the, therefore, you have the color space conversion, one thing, and then you have the subsampling of other color spaces, which is optional. And on top of that, yeah, then you have uh, the, um, the the uh, the uh, the Fourier, um, uh, Fourier transform, which uh, which is a which um, um, is able to uh, throw out um, yeah, let's call it low scale variations in uh, in your image that are you usually not percept perceptible to the human eye, and therefore drastically reduces the file size. Um, and at the end, if you if you Try to work with that JPEG image again and reload it. Um, these are the things uh, that have been thrown out and are, and are not available to you anymore. So those, so so I um, perhaps happily in my career haven't worked too much with with JPEG images. Floor. I think the point, the boiling those points down, the uh, what is happening when something is saved in this this format, the. Um, there's information is being destroyed in the image and the information that's being got rid of is stuff that we as people kind of perceive as being too important so if we put the two images the one without the information the one in, with the information next to each other we look at them we're kind of like yeah that's okay but um when you're using software to try and extract data you kind of have to be aware of that and there's probably there's there's information that software could extract that we wouldn't perceive as as humans is that is that is that the kind of core point that it, we should make sure that people are aware of that is that a fair interpretation of what you're saying florian or ish yeah uh, mm, uh kind of that there uh, that um the, the, the people are uh, the people are aware that there are uh, limitations already in the uh, how they how they store things that they lose information without wanting to do so and first and the next thing on how they get their data that they might try to um, inter interpret uh, information in data where the actual information was not present anymore since the input file format doesn't even have that scale available Okay, so over interpretation, certainly, and, and I think that's something that's an, I've come across in microscopy where there is information that the image in the image which appears to be beyond the resolution of the, the system that's used to acquire the image. Um, so I, I guess, I guess the, the question is kind of do, do we sort of sufficiently inform and, and warn people in the content? And, and I think we do a bit, but we could potentially do more. Is that 
Okay. Um, do, do you think we've addressed this enough, Florian? Uh, what do you, um, my questions are in, in the in the in the, the, question, um, the questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, per I'm perfectly fine. Uh, you are aware of that, and uh, these are things that I wanted to bring up, which um, I consider important when when, when working uh, with images. Uh, that are, uh, when when working with um, how to say uh, either images gathered from a device or people uh, or images that well people gather with plain cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, um, yeah. Photo I mean, photographic cameras. Let's put it that way. I think it's a really interesting point. The the section that we have in the lesson in the moment about lossy compression. I think I don't know whether we directly say it, but it feels like it's implied that the kind of loss of detail um, in the in the compressed version of the image is is kind of uniform and if i understood correctly what you were just describing in terms of how j compression happens in the jpeg that's not true that it's done differently depending on the on the um color for example and so it certainly sounds like there's potential for us to um sharpen up that section i guess and and better convey the the hazards of, of processing um, data that's been compressed in a lossy format like that. And maybe that that's, that there's no uniform uh, loss across file formats uh, in, in a certain sense, that um, people have to be really aware of their devices, their limitations, and the uh, file formats that they use to transfer these things. That this is not uni that this is not a uniform concept that is as simple as RGB image. An RB RGB image is always um, kind of uh, like that if it's stored as an RGB image, but as soon as it's uh, as you pass it through a device or through a file format, which kind of is also a device, in ab abstractly speaking, then basically to any kind of transformation is uh, is can be applied. That um, first thing that is that. Okay, it's good to good to, good feedback. I think, um, uh, uh, Eva, you uh, have your hand up. Yeah, so um, I come from, I'm an astronomer, um, and despite the all beautiful color chemical images that are being um, distributed around the world, we actually take black and white images. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. is there an echo? There was a slight echo. I think it's kind of gone. Yeah. Oh, no, it hasn't. Okay, so I'll try again now, please. There we go. Yeah. So astronomical images are black and white. Well, they're they're single channel. They're um, um, using CCDs. Um, so I love all the concepts that the lesson explains. But for us, for astronomers, like there is no such thing as a color image for research. Um, do you think that lesson can be taught without all of that? Uh, that's a that's a Good, good question. Uh, I, I think I would have to um, go and sort of look through and see how the, I, I think it would be hard um, from what I know of the lesson because I think a lot of the examples used are color images and we use, we move between color and grayscale. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that the way one might approach it would be to sort of te teach the <laughs> teach the color and and then hope that there's not so much of it that that people are um can't when they go on go on and work in their normal practice hmm. uh, i think that it's not we don't have like all of the the rgb stuff in one place in the lesson that you could mm -hmm. easily um remove it i think you'd have to teach it and then say well this is perhaps not relevant in this particular domain. Yeah, but I still like the concept of histogramming and thresholding and um, yeah, source detection. That that's still very relevant to stuff that we do. Masking. I I, I think a single channel. <laughs> do you do you ever have um, multiple full channels? Um, 
the we, more, you know, not RGB color channels, but. Yeah, so, okay, I guess that's, that's another way to think of it. We usually take, um, so we put, uh, filters like physical actual filters in front of the detector that only limit a certain wavelength range that falls on the detector um, so we might have like multiple of these um, so when we actually um, uh, analyze them for research we make color images just for publications or for mm -hmm. public outreach but yeah I guess you can you can think of those as like different channels yeah, I, I I I hope that people could do That's the lesson and, and kind yeah. of so where I've worked with optical fluorescence microscopy, we would have you know, non-visible light channels, and you you work with them in exactly the same way. Really, mm -hmm. you might have two channels, you might have four. Image. So I think my my feeling, having sort of done this in practice and looked at the lessons, is this equips people to deal with quite a wide range of image data that's not sort of an optical photograph that's my yeah my, my feeling about it it's still yeah that's a good point thank you for bringing that up mm -hmm. thanks, thanks. Can just yeah have a data set that's um that's multiple different filters what we call them yeah we do yeah. the same way it's um yeah it's, I, it's in software it's it's kind of handled the same way mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Thanks for that that question. Uh, what what other questions do people have about the the lesson content that I've described? Bob, I had a couple of questions that I've put into the Etherpad about, um, or oh, well, one really about rights in the image, knowing that this is something that changes between different countries. So it, perhaps this is something to perhaps glance to and put into the extras component. Um, I, I feel something about um, this lesson really focuses on um, image analysis and, and, you know, and working with image data. Uh, it's, it would be helpful though to somehow reinforce or point to um, some of those basic um, reproducibility and um, good data practices in um, uh, rights management and uh, perhaps applying licenses or, or understanding the rights inherent in image data. Has that come up um, previously? I think that's a, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I um, agree that this is, uh, this is, this is in, very important stuff. I think Toby might be able to speak to whether this has has been has come up in any of the previous runs or in the development. Whether any decisions have been. I don't expect Toby to have an encyclopedic knowledge of every decision that was made throughout. But uh, is there anything? Any remarks on this, Toby? Yeah, I mean, I, I would prefer not to have had to give this answer, but I think that sort of no. <laughs> um, it's. It, it's, that's that's I, also okay. Yeah. So well, uh, I mean, it's the honest answer, at least. I I agree that I think it would be good to talk about it, and I think that that it, it what you've identified here is is a hole in the narrative, I suppose, of the lesson in that we talk about. You've got this data. I, I suppose there's holes at each end that Florian has has highlighted that we're not talking very much about where the data comes from in the first place. And then what you're talking about is a little bit to do with that and also to do with what you might do with data, image data, once you've finished working with it um, in terms of publishing it alongside your research findings and so on. And I think the I hope that there's space in the lesson for both of those things, because I think it would be really important because at the moment, I think the lesson is really discussing image processing in isolation from its context. And especially with the data carpentry curriculum, the context is actually really important and, and talking about these things alongside the considerations of where that image data has come from and where you might put it once you're finished with it and so on 
um, is, is important. So yeah, thanks for bringing this up, Liz. I think it would be interesting to see whether there are specific, which there probably are specific considerations for image data in terms of um, practices and uh, licenses as, a, um, as opposed to other, uh, other types of data. I think that would be really interesting. Um, do, do we have other questions on the, the sort of general questions on anything we've, we've covered in the last couple of hours? I, I think um, if people would like to put anything in, we've got, we're kind of running out of time to sort of properly stop and do the, the do breakout things and thank you for con contributing and, and participating in that. Um, if anybody would like to add anything in there now typed, if you prefer to, to do that, then um, then please, please do that while we're finishing up. Um, Florian, another question? Yeah, sorry, just found it among my notes um, for the entire lesson. Uh, what is the time schedule that you had in my, uh, that you had in mind? How is it intended to be taught in, in in your opinion? Um, I'll let I'll let hands and answer that. All right, I was just putting the link to the lesson in the chat um that landing page for the lesson includes a, a schedule table um with estimated timing of about 11 hours of total teaching so across two days um or four half days if you prefer to do it that way i guess um but i want to stress at this point that the lesson has changed quite a lot since the last time it was really taught um, with someone paying close attention to the timing. And so some of those estimated timings are going to be wrong. I am, my hope is that some of them are wrong in one direction and some of them are wrong in the other direction. And in the end, it averages out of being about right still. Um, but Florian, you're preparing to teach this, I think, in one of the beta pilots. And so this is one of the pieces of information we're really um, keen to, to get hold of. Um, but yeah, the, the short answer is that the lesson's designed to be taught in a two-day workshop. OK. Um, I think we should be open for surprises. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any final thoughts from yeah. our speakers? Yeah, just, or just on, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, just on the, the timing. When you say two-day workshop, do you mean two-day face-to-face workshop, knowing that two-day online is a bit longer than that? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, I think Bob mentioned early on that there are prerequisites for this lesson. Um, you know, this is one of the curricula that we have that is not aimed at novices in the sense that we expect learners to arrive with some familiarity and kind of basic comfort level working with Python, for example. And my feeling is that this is an instance where time and effort put into trying to make sure that that is actually the people that arrive at the workshop um, is really going to pay off in terms of how long it takes to teach. Because if people are, are trying to learn the foundational concepts of Python at the same time as learning the foundational concepts of image processing, the cognitive load associated with that is going to be so much greater than if they come um, comfortable with Python already so that they can focus completely on the um, the image processing as the only new concepts that are being introduced to them. So. Um, so how long it takes is to a certain extent up to you as, as the people that are advertising to an audience or a potential audience to try to get people to come to the workshop. Well, good, good luck. I look forward to hearing how the beta tests go.
final questions, final thoughts. Well, we managed to fill the two hours. Uh, let's thank again our speakers, Bob, David, and Toby. Uh, thank you all for a great presentation and uh, enjoy the rest of CarpentryCon. Thank you very much.